Welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you made it because tonight is actually a historical night. If you don't know what's been happening, there's this shift that's happening. The, the, the language that we use to talk about ourselves, the, um, the mainstream medical model language, it, is based on this book, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. People know it? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. so it's 2015. And that way of thinking about mental disorders is in this process of shifting. There's all these people that aren't believing in it anymore, but it still holds an incredible amount of power. The two people who are here tonight, Anne and Peter, are two of the people who are helping to change the model, and they just happen to be visiting from New York, and so we grabbed them from this, uh, this conference they were speaking at to come and talk to us. Um, so we're really lucky to have them, and uh, um, you should know some context, which is that there was this article in the New York Times about two months ago that was about this booklet that, that they're going to tell you all about. The one you've the, got. The one you've got. Yeah. And, um, and, <laughs> and a whole bunch of people ended up reading that article, including the former president of the American Psychiatric Association, who was so flustered when he read the article that he wrote a response to it saying that these people that are here right now are dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just... You know, there's a bunch of us here in the, in the audience who are part of the Icarus Project New York City, and I think everyone here in our own way is really interested in changing the, the, the language and the culture of what's considered mental health and mental illness. And tonight, like, we're lucky enough to have these folks who are going to give us a taste of the work that they've been doing, and, and hopefully we're going to have a really good conversation afterwards. So give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everybody. Oh, it's working. Hi, my name's Anne Cook. Um, we're going to talk to you about this this book that we've written, um, which is up there. We've been sending them around. There's a pile here. If anybody hasn't got one, there's a pile at the front. There's also a copy of a previous book that we did uh, called Understanding Bipolar Disorder, uh, which came out in 2011. So we're giving you that as well in case uh, that's of interest. It takes a kind of similar approach. So anyway, um, okay, we're here to talk about um, this book uh, that's just come out. It was published in November of last year in the UK, and we've just done the US launch, and was it the day before yesterday, here in New York, which is why we're in New York. Um, so we're just going to tell you a bit about it. We'll speak for about maybe 10 minutes each only, because really we'd like to spend time having a bit of conversation, so then we'll have a bit of time for conversation with all of us after that. Uh, okay, so shall, shall we do introductions first and then I'll, yeah, I, my name's Anne Cook, I'm a clinical psychologist in the UK uh, and I'm the editor of, of the book. Uh, and you okay, so I'm Peter Kinderman, I'm a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Liverpool um, and I'm merely a humble co-author and contributor. <laughs> not that humble. Don't know about the humble, yeah. No, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not good at humble. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, yeah, I guess this is, like Sasha was saying, this is kind of what we're trying to do. It sounds a bit grandiose, but we are really about trying to change society's whole approach to psychosis. And uh, I'll tell you a bit about what, why, um, what motivated us to do it. That's kind of my bit. And then Peter will talk about what we're actually saying. So hopefully you'll get an idea of the, the direction in which we hope it will change. Okay. So, oh, sorry, can you go back, Sasha? Yeah. Um, this is the website. The, you've got a copy of the paper version of the book. There's also a downloadable version, which is also free, um, from the British Psychological Society website. But the, the shortcut to it is this one, www.understandingpsychosis.net. So pass that URL on, um, because everybody's free to download it. OK, thanks. Okay, so this is part of our motivation. I don't know if you have headlines like that here, but uh, <laughs> this is the, unfortunately, I hate to tell you, the, uh, the British newspaper with the largest circulation, The Sun. It's not a good one, I don't think, but anyway, it's a very popular one. Um, the famous, there was a news story, it probably hasn't, hasn't reached here, but it was a big victory because for the, for the last 30 years or a lot longer there, there's been a topless woman on page three, and there's a big campaign by feminists, this is quite good for a feminist bookstore, uh, 
recently and they actually forced them to, to stop so they now no longer have topless women on page three which is great anyway that's the kind of newspaper it is but unfortunately that makes it very very popular so it's the most popular and and the you know this is the coverage that you get of, of mental health issues it's always often uh, to do with violence so 1200 people killed by mental patients you know as if mental patients are like a, a different species uh, and this word mental patients anyway um, and always the, the, the association with violence so um, we, we kind of tried to articulate what the stereotype is um, in the, I guess, the public imagination, if you like, as, as depicted in the media. Um, and uh, Peter came up with this, actually. Um, so the stereotype, someone who has psychotic experiences is different from normal people because his brain is damaged or different, probably because of his genes. Notice it's a he. It's usually a he in the stereotype. He is, quote, a schizophrenic who is not understandable, is dangerous, has no legitimate voice, and requires control through drugs which target the underlying brain disorder. So that's kind of the stereotype that's in the public mind. That's how people think of schizophrenia. I don't know if it's the same. Would you say it's similar here? Yeah. Sure. Yes? OK. Next slide. Thank you. OK, so this is, um, this is kind of websites. If you look out there on the internet, you'll get a lot of information saying very similar things. Um, and of course, a lot of the uh, websites are sponsored by Big Pharma, by drug companies. So, uh, yeah, Eli Lilly, uh, one of the one of the biggest drug companies, one of the biggest companies in the world, I think, have a lot of websites about their products, which have statements about what schizophrenia is, for example. So I won't I won't read them, but you can read them yourself. Uh, there's all the websites they came from. Basically, always saying that something along the lines of schizophrenia is a devastating brain disorder and you need our products to right the chemical imbalance. That's the kind of story that, that, that you see out there. So, um, yeah, this is uh, our boss, if you like, the head of the Division of Clinical Psychology of the British Psychological Society, came up with this phrase, the end of compulsory mental illness thinking is what we're trying to bring about. So, um, this is a... a a quote from the report, and it's kind of the central message, if you like. Professionals should not insist that people accept any one particular framework of understanding. For example, that their experiences are symptoms of an illness. We're not saying that's wrong, necessarily, just that it's not the only way to think about these things. Because um, if you think about it, all we really know is that people have certain experiences. Um, or in, fa in fact, unless you're that person, you don't even know what the experience is like. We know that people talk about having certain experiences like feeling paranoid, like hearing voices. And we know that people sometimes behave in ways that are embarrassing or whatever. But that's all we know. We don't actually know what's causing that. And of course, it may be different for everybody. But there's always this assumption that if people have certain experiences or behave in certain ways, that means they have a, an underlying brain disorder. Um, but actually, we don't know that. There's no blood test for schizophrenia. There's no independent test. These are interpretations. <laughs> And they're not the only way of interpreting, which is, I guess, uh, one of the main messages of our report. Okay, so like I said, we're not saying that the idea of mental illness is necessarily wrong, just that it's not the only way of understanding these things, and it's one that has pros and cons, if you like, advantages and disadvantages. So this slide is about some of the advantages. So, you know, it it does provide a way of talking about very difficult things because, of course, these the experiences, however you understand them, they're very real. And for a lot of people, they can be very distressing and people need help. So the idea of illness does provide a way of thinking and talking about the experiences and a way of providing help. So, you know, uh, not always useful help, some people think, but anyway, it is, it is a way of um, providing help. So like uh, pills, psychotherapy, also, a, a reason to have um, a, a way that people can take off time off sick off work, for example, when they need it, if they're not able to function um, or, 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 get, or get benefits. Okay, uh, so that's like the good bits, if you like, the, the advantages of it. But it also has quite significant costs. And one is, um, you know, the, the stereotype that I was talking about earlier is one that is in a lot of people's heads, including people who would receive the labels. So this is somebody who's become quite famous called Johnny Benjamin uh, in the UK recently. And he, has, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. 
Um, and this is what he said. I felt like I'd been given a life sentence. All I knew was what I read in the papers, that people with schizophrenia are violent and incapable of recovery. So of course, if, if that's what you believe about uh, how your life is going to be, that's very, very depressing and arguably a, an unhelpful message and possibly a, a self-fulfilling prophecy as well. So uh, yeah, has disadvantages. Um, this is another one. Um, Sometimes th th there's a lot of um, stigma um, associated with the idea of mental illness sometimes, and um, sometimes people feel a great sense of shame. Um, this is, um, this is a, bit, a bit of a shameless blog, um, plug, actually, for uh, my blog. Well, not only mine, but the, the university department where I work. Um, Discursive of Tunbridge Wells. We're based in Tunbridge Wells, which is a, a small town in England, famous only for being home for retired colonels from India, from the British Empire, um, who had nothing better to do all day than to write disgusted letters to newspapers about things that they disapprove of, uh, and to the, to the editors. And traditionally, they signed themselves disgusted of Tunbridge Wells. So, <laughs> so since we have the great pleasure to be based in Tunbridge Wells, we uh, called our site discursive of Tunbridge Wells. Anyway, um, so you won't forget that now, will you? Um, but it's, yeah, I, mean, I would say this, but it's a, it's a good site in the sense that uh, a lot of it is mental health related because we're in a um, clinical psychology department, that's what we're interested in. But also we try very much to open it up to really different perspectives. So you'll, you'll see blogs by people with radically different perspectives and also all w walks of life. So a lot of famous professors, but also a lot of people who've never written something before in their life, students, writing their first ever blog, or people with lived experience, so it's a real mixture. Anyway, this is somebody um, somebody with lived experience who's a quite a frequent, uh, she's done quite a few pieces on our blog, called Faye Thomas, and uh, she wrote this piece um, about the time that DSM-5 was published, and like Sasha was saying, there was, there was a big uh, debate about that, and the whole idea of diagnosis and mental illness be began being discussed a bit in the public sphere, and uh, she said, um, I, you probably can't read the small bit, but she started off saying how excited she was, saying um, she was almost as excited as the, the day that the Berlin Wall came down or the day that Nelson Mandela was, was released from prison. And this is why, because of the really negative effect that, that receiving a diagnosis had had on her personally and on her family. So I'm just going to read this bit. That, that possibility, that's that you know, we might have a different way of thinking about it, that possibility feels good but it can't erase the fact that my family has been shamed and defamed by psychiatric diagnosis. Our lives, historical and present, are forever affected by it. We have felt different. We have felt defective and unacceptable. We felt that our genes were inadequate and shouldn't be reproduced. We felt that our diagnoses had to be hidden because others might think us dangerous or unpredictable. At times, we felt so other that we had to hide our experiences, even from one another. We lived with secrets and silence that reached into every corner of our lives. So I guess that's the point of reading that out, is, is something about these aren't just academic arguments. These are you know, real things that have real effects on real people. And uh, yeah, the sense of shame that she had felt comes through really strongly there, I think. Thank you. Okay, so this is uh, again something about the, the possible negative effects of, of um, the idea of mental illness. It gives us misplaced certainty, this kind of story that you often get in traditional mental health services, um, that you know the professionals know best, they know what's going on. Um, often you're not, well, very rarely you're, you're offered a, a choice of how to understand what's going on. You're told you have a, a mental illness, something wrong with your brain, and this will fix it. Um, we know what you need, and uh, you know, obviously so it, th there's compulsory medication it happens quite a lot in the UK and I think here as well. Okay, a another kind of negative effect can be we put misplaced inattention, in other words, the things that it distracts our attention from. So the things, you know, we know how much an association there is between mental health and the circumstances of people's lives. So the things that are m m the most likely to predict whether you'll develop a mental health problem are things like this is uh, racism, uh, child abuse, um, and here um, homelessness and, and poverty. So 
but, but by locating the problem inside people's heads, this idea of illness, um, can divert our attention from that because you know we're not, we're not looking out there at those things. You know, we talk about preventing mental health problems. We're not looking out there. We're again just looking at what goes on inside people's heads. Okay, so this is my last slide. It's kind of what, what I was saying. It, in terms of preventing mental health problems, are we currently mopping the floor and leaving the tap still running, or the faucet, I think you call it here, um, the water still flowing? Because arguably, uh, and Peter will talk about this, that there's, um, and it's presented in our report, research about this, about the links between the circumstances of our lives and later mental health problems. Um, um, means that really um, by only all the time just thinking about individual therapy, individual medication, looking at, you know, trying to help people basically after they've developed problems, um, we're arguably just trying to, it's a bit like trying to mop the floor with, with uh, leaving the water running. So really we need to put our attention much more on what's happening out there that, that, uh, that happens to people. There's this, there's this uh, big fr uh, phrase that we're that we quite like in the UK at the moment. Don't ask what's wrong with me, ask what's happened to me. Okay, I think that's me, it's you now, isn't it? Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, so all I'm gonna do is kind of, kind of what I'm gonna do is mildly redundant because most of you have copies of the, the report. So all I'm gonna do is briefly go through what's in the report. So I'll talk through what we, what we say. Um, to start off with, one of the things is, is just a quote that Anne and I like from uh, Jay Watts, who's a service user in the, in the UK who read the report and then basically sent Anne an email that, that said, there's facts, there's number crunching, there's evidence, there's argument, uh, but we produce something which is a space for the voices of people who, who are suffering and those who have thrived outside the psychiatric system. And I guess uh, I, I wouldn't like to see myself as a, as a sort of user activist. I don't think that's my role. But I think it is quite nice to have created uh, a little bit of space for those voices to come out. And maybe a little bit of a kind of uh, professionalized backup for some of the stuff that comes out of activist movements. So the activist movement doing their stuff, and there's a bit of professional support for the work that, that folk like you are doing. OK. Um, as Anne mentioned, there's another copy of uh, uh, a report very similar about um, those sorts of problems that often get labelled by psychiatry systems as bipolar disorder, taking a slightly more psychosocial perspective on those kinds of problems. Uh, there was a report that uh, Anne and I worked on, the, the rather dull blue and white, uh, unimpressive cover uh, that we wrote 15 years ago, because we, we've improved our quality of message giving since then, um, <laughs> that's still available. And uh, one that is in rather poorly formatted, which is because it's not yet been produced, but Shortly, we will uh, support our colleagues in producing a report on low mood and, uh, and feelings of hopelessness and worthlessness that are sometimes labelled as depression. Uh, it's worth giving a, a, a heads up and kudos to some of the people that have contributed. Um, we're quite pleased with this. There's a kind of mixed bag here. Um, so there are some uh, uh, experts by profession, there are some experts by experience, and some of us were, uh, had both hats on. Uh, and some of us come out about these things. Um, and also, kudos also to Anita Klein, who I think looks vaguely similar to her paintings. Um, <laughs> th there's a, she denies this. I, I also happen to think that, that the bird there is talking to the woman, but both Anita and Anne think that the bird is just a bird. But we, I, don't, <laughs> we don't know, that's my point. Um, <laughs> One of the things that we, there, there's a phenomenon in, uh, in the UK called head clutcher. So one of the things that the media do is they need to have a website and they need to have a website about somebody who's feeling suicidal, so like this. So we deliberately and deliberately chose artwork that would illustrate a different perspective. It's, it carries nothing more than an ethos, of, a, a meme, a theme. But the theme is, it's just, this is just life, you know? And life has its, has its strange birds that talk things into you. <laughs> so thank you to it. This is, this is the content, so it, it's a report, so it, it does what reports do, it has parts, it has part one, part two, part three, and it goes through the stuff. Um, so we, we, we talk about the descriptions, we talk about the definitions, we talk about some of the stats, some of the statistics, some of the facts and figures. We talk about uh, some explanations, some theoretical models for why people might end up experiencing these sorts of problems. And then, importantly, we talk about what can help, 
and how we as both as service providers but also as societies need to respond uh, differently to these kinds of problems. And finally, we have quite a lot of material there that people can look up. Unfortunately, websites go out of date, so I can't absolutely guarantee that every link works, but you know, it gives a pointer for, for Googling some of this information. They worked in November, but life moves on. Okay, um, so what do we say? Well, the first thing that we say is that hearing voices or feeling paranoid are experiences which are quite common, and they can often be a response to situations like trauma, abuse, or deprivation. Not in every case, but there's a, in technical language, there's a strong, strong statistical correlation. And to call these experiences symptoms of mental illness or to call them symptoms of psychosis or schizophrenia is only one way of thinking about them, as Anne said, and it has advantages and disadvantages. We are psychologists and we wrote the report as a report by psychologists and, and colleagues working with us. And so we're taking a specifically psychological approach to these. These are psychological phenomena. These are part of what it means to be human. Some of us, you know, this, we're in a feminist bookshop. Some of us, some of us love people that are the same gender as us. That's, that's the way life is. Hey, get over it. Some of us hear voices. That's what we do. And some of us have strange beliefs. So people believe in things like the power of Western democracy to change the world for the better. <laughs> So as I've already hinted, there's no clear dividing line between psychosis and other thoughts and feelings, I believe. <laughs> I did mention, yeah, the kind of, as we were playing this, but this is a quote directly from the executive summary. So psychosis can be understood in the same way as other psychological problems, such as anxiety, shyness, or voting Republican. So, <laughs> sorry, it's shameless. Sorry. What can I say? Okay. Um, we're... We try to be clear that there's a spectrum of experiences. There's a spectrum of experiences in terms of the nature of the phenomenon. So quite a lot of people hear voices but don't see those as problems that they need to get any help with. Some people see voices as, uh, as gifts that offer them different perspectives on life's challenges. But of course, for some people, these problems can be uh, very threatening, very emotionally threatening, and can have a very deleterious effect on people's lives. So we're not trying to minimise the problems, what we're trying to say is that uh, there's a spectrum of problems. For some people these problems are indeed uh, life-threatening or life-limiting or even life-ending. Um, and therefore we believe that helping people with major mental health problems should be a national priority. In the UK, in, in Europe, that's a slightly different picture than in, in the US because of the nature of our healthcare funding, but our campaign is for for uh, a public funded uh, free to access healthcare system that addresses all of these problems. So as Anne said, some people find it useful to think of themselves as having an illness and in the current society it's actually practically quite useful to describe yourself on occasions as having an illness. Uh, but other people prefer to think of their problems in other ways. So uh, other people think of some of these experiences as aspects of their personality that can cause them problems or aspects of their personality or their way of engaging with the world that can sometimes cause them problems in some circumstances. And professionals, we argue, shouldn't insist that people accept any one particular framework of understanding uh, and they shouldn't insist, for instance, that people accept that their experiences are part of an illness. There's a phenomenon from a few years ago about insight, that people lack or don't lack insight into their illness. And our argument would be that insisting that people have insight into the fact that they have a disease called schizophrenia would be a misplaced uh, use of the, our understanding of the nature of these phenomena. Uh, we argue, we're, we're psychologists, so we would argue this, um, that psychological therapies uh, of a variety of kinds are, are helpful for people. Um, and most people, both in the US and in the UK, find it difficult to get access to these services. I have to say that in the UK, our political... Uh, leaders, even from what is currently quite a right-wing conservative government, have actually been quite good at increasing the accessibility of uh, psychological therapies for people. Um, but we're not only saying that one-to-one -one psychological therapies are valuable, we're also saying that everybody should have the opportunity to sit down with professionals or with their peers and find ways of understanding their problems in ways that make sense to them and to plot a plan for how to help them achieve a, a, a better standard of living. And that's a slightly more broad definition of psychological help than merely one-to-one -one psychotherapy. 
Some people find that, many people find that antipsychotic medication helps make the experiences less frequent or intense or distressing, um, but there's no evidence that this addresses an underlying abnormality. Um, that's one way of thinking about it, and one way of thinking about the effect of antipsychotic medication is that this antipsychotic medication is targeting an underlying brain abnormality. Other ways of thinking about it is that the drugs can be effective for people, but in other ways. Um, for instance, by reducing the stress uh, or the distress associated with the experiences by giving a sort of emotional buffer, by, by clouding and blunting some of the emotional experiences. And that may or may not be a direct treatment effect, but it might be helpful for people. Again, we're not insisting that people stop taking their medication, neither are we insisting that people do take their medication. What we're suggesting is that you should sit down with your colleagues and work out what's helpful for people in each situation. And further, we're suggesting that the person who is themselves experiencing these problems should be the person to make the ultimate decision about what helps them based on their experience. We argue that psychosis, uh, psychotic experiences are uh, often related to experiences of abuse, deprivation, victimization and racism. Not for everybody. Uh, as a psychologist I also understand that people get into vicious cycles. So relatively small, perhaps even apparently insignificant events can build over time to cause people to develop quite significant problems. But for many people we know that deprivation, victimization, racism, school bullying uh, and childhood abuse, especially sexual abuse, uh, is quite strongly related to psychotic experiences. We also know that uh, both our current society and unfortunately services are quite racist and therefore people from black and minority ethnic communities are more likely than other people to be diagnosed with schizophrenia and there is some evidence that once in the mental health services their, their experiences are different and sometimes uh, harsher for various reasons, more compulsion and less likely to be offered psychological therapies. In the report itself um, there's a tradition, I think, amongst uh, the weavers of, of carpets in the Middle East that they put deliberate flaws in the carpet because there's a theological view that nothing created by human hands is perfect because perfection is the reserve of God. And we certainly don't believe that our report is perfect. It has flaws. And one of the flaws is that we didn't pay enough attention to uh, black and minority ethnic issues in our report. Uh, and uh, we intend to address that both in terms of, of addressing some flaws in the report itself, but also by, I hope, commissioning further uh, work to look specifically at that, that issue. Um, so I suppose a plea from the heart would be, yes, we know, don't judge us too harshly. And there might be things in there that you think are omitted or possibly worded badly, but uh, we, like everybody else, are merely humans. Even I am merely <laughs> human. Um, and finally, we argue that services need to change radically. Uh, and we can go into some detail about what that might mean. And then we need to invest in prevention by taking measures to reduce abuse, deprivation and in inequality. Again, as Anne pointed out, I think it's worth repeating, regarding, even if you take a psychological approach, you can still regard these issues as residing inside the heads of the individuals rather than what, uh, residing in how ordinary human beings respond to unequal, oppressive and abusive societies. And the way that we as professionals, but also our politicians uh, might wish to respond is by uh, addressing some of the issues. Uh, I'll just point out, which I often do when people ask questions, I sit on a, uh, on a city level planning board called the Health and Wellbeing Board for the City of Liverpool and my place is next to the Police and Crime Commissioner. Uh, she regards her job as including preventing future mental health problems by finding and uh, removing from society those people who prey upon children. I agree with her. I, th I think there's a political and policing issue that's directly related to mental health. And it's not just a question of waiting until people have symptoms of mental illness. We need to address societal issues as well. Unfortunately, those societal issues also include wealth inequality, and that's when the politicians get a little bit more jumpy. But, <laughs> but I'm not a politician. And that's it. That's all we have to say. Um, if you have smartphones, and most of the people in the UK have, apparently there are more smartphones in the UK than there are people. So if you point your smartphone at this, you'll be able to go directly to understandingpsychosis.net and download a copy of the, of the report and find other things there that you will find uh, of interest. And I think that's it. So thank you very much.
our guests are here from the other side of the world, and, <laughs> and, um, and they've come and presented to us. And I'm wondering if there's folks who have questions. I mean, I figure, you know, we have this limited, we have this limited time to, to, to talk to these folks. Yeah. I have a question. Um, in your research or studies, have you seen any individuals showcase uh, these issues, but instead of as flaws or deficits, as adaptations, yes. they've enhanced um, a colleague of mine at Liverpool is a, a, a woman called uh, Dr. Eleanor Longdon. You should look her up. She's on uh, YouTube as a TED Talk. It's had four million hits so far. But what she says is that she got the highest uh, graduating score for any student at the University of Leeds, which is a major university in, in the UK. She got the highest score ever recorded in, the, in her final exam. Uh, but she thinks that she, maybe she should hand back her degree because she was cheating. And she was cheating because the voices were giving her the answers to the questions. So she's had problems, she's had difficulties, she's experienced some uh, stress in her life, and she's been a user of mental health services, um, but she's a fantastic human being. And I guess the answer is not that she's a fantastic human being and her worth as a human being is enhanced by the voices. She's just a person who's heard voices and had psychotic experiences and in part distressing and in part life-affirming. That's who she is. So have a, Eleanor Longdon, uh, it's a fantastic TED talk, it's brilliant, four million hits. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's something that we, it, there is a section in the report on that and I guess it's uh, partly what attracted me as well to the Icarus project, this idea, <laughs> yeah. uh, your, your idea of the dangerous gift that, you know, um, that in, in certain circumstances and for certain people, these experiences can be positive. They don't have to be negative at all. So, yeah. Or both, obviously. Um, I think it's valuable for having ideas. What's up, Laura? Sorry. People think, and that's what they do. Their lived experience as an illness, and it's um, just part of who they are. Um, how would you deal with them if someone uh, has in situations where they might be sectioned, how, in other words, how would that coincide with if, if they're, whether they're, youth, they, they, they think they're not in, in any systems, but someone else, you know, has a good way they think that this person is not doing well or needs to tell. Yeah. You should repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, the, 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 the question is how does all the, if, if I paraphrase you correctly, how does all this apply in a situation where somebody uh, doesn't believe they're ill, but the doctors do, and they're sectioned. Is that? Yeah. Um, well, we, th again, there's a bit in the report on that. Um, I think, you know, obviously there is an issue that, you know, uh, we're not saying that people don't have problems and don't sometimes get into very dangerous situations. And obviously, as a society, we need to find a way of looking after each other. Um, but that's very different from saying to, pe saying to people, um, you have a men as the mental health uh, law does in England anyway, it supposes that when you have a mental health problem, you don't have the ability yourself to make those decisions, so we have to make them for you because you are mentally ill, and we will treat you. Um, and I, there's a debate in England, I don't know if it's here as well, about... Um, I think a lot of people accept that in some circumstances um, people need to, people need to be kept safe. Um, so there is possibly a place for um, legislation of some sort when they can't make decisions for themselves. Um, but there's a bit more of a debate about compulsory treatment, which obviously of, often boils down to compulsory medication. Uh, and there are a lot of um, people with lived experience in Britain who think that um, compulsory compulsion. Uh, as in detention in a facility or some kind of crisis unit is okay, but compulsory medication isn't. Yeah, there, there's, there's a variety. So there's the compulsory detention for safety reasons versus compulsory treatment, especially with drugs. And then there's the issue of the criteria for which people might ever be detained against their will. And I think there's slightly more consensus amongst the community from which Anne and I come that the guiding principle there shouldn't be whether somebody's ill or not, but whether they're able to make decisions for themselves. And certainly speaking purely for myself, I think that if somebody can make decisions for themselves, they have an absolute right to make decisions for themselves. If somebody is unable to make decisions for themselves, if either their mental disability, uh, their mental capacity, or, or indeed 
delusional beliefs make it very difficult for them to make decisions for themselves. I actually think we do have a duty to uh, to act in their best interest if they're not able to make decisions. So for me, the cutoff. But my point would be, as Anne says, that's very different from if you're ill, we'll section you. It's more, if you're not able to make decisions for yourself, we have a duty to look after you. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, you know, if this is like a kind of general question, um, how does universal health care affect One of the things that happens when you come to sorry, the question. So, so the question is about universal health care. Um, one of the things that happens when you come to other countries is you tend to be uh, diffident and uh, you tend to be very polite towards the country that's hosting you. You about uh, not to be. I'm about not to be. Um, <laughs> uh, the UK's National Health Service is one of the most fantastic gifts to the world. Um, we, we supply people with healthcare free at the point of delivery and as broadly as possible equitable to all. It's not perfect, so we're arguing a lot in the, in the UK for increased services. Uh, but I think on the, well, the, uh, the World Health Organization described Britain's mental health care as the best in Western Europe, but that was by a guy who was only looking at Western Europe. I think it's, it's nowhere near perfect, but I think universal health care in the European model is, uh, uh, is just... perfect but I think that the provision of high quality mental health care in, in the UK is very good I think people are there, there's still a biological model people are still prescribed high doses of medication people are still detained against the will in hospitals and too many are detained against the will too many people are given electroshock treatment but I think on balance uh, I would rather have a psychotic crisis in the UK than pretty much anywhere else in the world yeah Approach, and I just feel like if people 
you know, that just talking to ordinary people to go beyond academia and go beyond the professional, you know, closed community and talk to groups like this and, and involve ordinary people, that that, I think people will more and more break from the biological diagnostic model and support other kinds of approaches. Thank you. I think it's worth mentioning this idea of, of uh, uh, an inclusive way of discussing uh, emotional crises is part of a, a movement called Open Dialogue. And Anne and I were at a, an organization called the Parachute Project um, up in Queens earlier today. So, so this is starting to become mainstream. So they were saying that they, this is now a, a billable service within US Medicare, Medicaid, whichever it is. So the idea of having uh, a democratic dialogue with people about how they would like to work with you to help them address problems in their lives, that's starting to become mainstreamed. And yeah, I think that people in, in the UK, people in Finland, people in Europe, we've been doing our bit, but it's also, it was fantastic to see actually quite a well-funded project that's been being mainstreamed in, in New York City. So there's pockets of excellence in loads of places. Uh, yeah, the question was um, that the, the, the DSM, the current um, di ca categorical diagnostic system, uh, is very powerful, makes psychiatrists almost like God, giving people a diagnosis, right? And uh, could, there's a, another way of looking at it is on dimensions rather than categories, and could that be more empowering for the patient, right? Yeah, you look yeah. like you're going to... No, I was, just watching, I was just watching the pictures change. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you, do you want to talk to this? Do you want to talk um, about this? Yes. Uh, it, uh, I, I, I was many, uh, no, I was going to say many years ago, a while ago I was uh, a representative of somebody in the UK looking at the roles of mental health professionals and uh, they made a terrible and foolish mistake which is to invite me to one of their meetings. And uh, draft one of the special role of the psychiatrist included uh, some phrase about uh, by virtue of their special uh, experience and training uh, the consultant psychiatrist has sapiential authority. So I put my hand up and said, I have no idea what the word sapiential means. And so we looked it up on Google, and it meant having special authority, brackets, often given directly by God, most brackets. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, uh, you know, that, that, that didn't... That got, that got, yeah. Yeah, that, well, that got cut. That wasn't in the final version. Um, yes, I think, I think that's right. Um, and you know, the, so the thing is, these things are circular. So, so somebody cuts themselves. And they cut themselves, and this is kind of bad news. You don't want to cut yourself. It's a, it's a bad thing. But why do they cut themselves? They cut themselves because they've got borderline personality disorder. How do we know they've got borderline personality disorder? Because they cut themselves. What causes the cutting? The borderline personality disorder. It's an illness that causes the cutting. Just, I was going to say, just cut through it all. This is a bad analogy. Yeah, I think both the spectrum issue and the sapiential authority issue, yeah, just say what, say what you see. Uh, you know, I, I would quite like to have some help. I've got myself in a difficult position. I, when, when life is difficult for me, I cut myself. Actually, as you may well be able to see, and as will appear on the cameras, I tend to pluck out my eyebrows when I'm stressed. It's kind of a bad thing, but it's not trichotillomania. It's not a mental illness diagnosed by plucking out my eyebrows. It's just that's what I do when I get stressed, and my wife hits me over the back of the head when I do it, which is a, an effective cure. <laughs> so the, the answer is, yeah, just say what you see. Um, and cut out the Latinized language, the obscure terms, the, and the implication that what's happening is that there's an illness which is the preserve of doctors. No, own, own it yourself. Describe what your problems are and say what you see. That would be my, my prescription. Um, yeah, first of all, I really want to thank you uh, tremendously for doing the work, especially, like you said, providing this kind of support for the larger movement. Um, I guess, I guess two, two parts here. Um, first, I'm really curious to hear about uh, the reactions that, you, that you've encountered through the work, um, positive and negative, and how you've reacted to them. And, um, and, and also, especially since we're all here, sort of the one next. I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued by this format of a, of a, 
of a, of a, of a, a report like this, but I'm wondering, like, like how, how can we help you and, and where do you see the larger movement kind of taking a message like this uh, out into the world? Okay, so the, react so the question was, number one, what reactions have we had, good and bad, and what do we think of them, right? And number two, what next? Okay, uh, shall I talk about the reactions and you can talk about what next? No, okay. Or something? Anyway, uh, okay, reactions. Well, it's been, it's, when we wrote about our visit to New York for this on the Mad in America website, we said causing a stir, because it kind of has. Uh, it's, there's been a lot, a lot of discussion about it. It's, it's, uh, yeah, stirred up a bit of dust, good and bad. We, I think generally really good. I mean, most of the reactions have been really, really good. Um, people say, you know, somebody's actually saying something that I've been thinking for years and thank you very much kind of thing. Um, and, um, yeah, a, a lot of um, quite important people in the, in the UK, uh, the national, our national clinical director for mental health, for example, who is a psychiatrist, have really, really welcomed it. Um, so it's got a lot of, um, a lot of coverage. It got on the, uh, the main national news program in, in the UK, um, so I think it's something about, I like to think it's an idea whose time has come, because it seems like um, there's a lot of receptivity to these ideas now. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of people think, and it would be nice to think that, you know, we're, on the, we're at a bit of a tipping point where people are seeing that, you know, the old days where the medical model was the, the only story available and the one that was held to be the truth is going and um, new ideas are coming in. I'd like to think that, I don't know. Um, so yeah, mainly uh, it's been really, really well received. We've had some criticisms. Um, the w one was about the um, not including enough about the specific issues for black and minority ethnic people, which Peter was talking about earlier, um, which, as I said, we think is well taken, and we're going to try and do something about that. Um, there's been, uh, in, particularly from America, actually, in the U.S., the reaction has been. Um, Quite angry from some psychiatrists, um, well, from what? like Jeffrey Levin. No, Alan Francis as well. well yeah. um, a bit less angry, probably. But the, the, the uh, I, th I think they're concerned. Well, they think you know they're right. They think that there is a thing called mental illness, and we're um, in danger of um, what did David uh, Jeffrey Lieberman say? Giving people license to doubt their diagnoses. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but. Um, so, yeah, the kind of authority has been questioned. And there is a, this isn't actually only for, I'm joking, but it's not only psychiatrists. Some, some people who use services as well have, have said, um, not many, but a few, that because we are keen to point out that these experiences don't have to be terrible and disabling and lifelong for everybody, that uh, that's in danger of making people feel excluded who, for whom they are. Uh, although we do acknowledge that they are, but, but some people have felt we haven't given that enough space and that those people who are very disabled for a long time uh, aren't quite addressed, that there's not quite enough about that in the report. So, uh, which, you know, fair, fair enough in a way, although we, d although we do say it, and also it's something about uh, wanting to be balancing as well as balanced, because there's enough messages about that out there already. So. So I guess what next is, um, well, I mean, one of the things that I think is the uh, sort of um, monolithic academic reports, um, not necessarily the only way, way forward, but maybe, maybe we've kind of done enough of that. So one of the things that I particularly want is for us to, for the next version of this to be uh, multi-professional. Now, there might be a degree of selection because I personally won't be uh, buying a, a uh, ticket to wherever it is that Jeffrey Lieberman works and uh, inviting him to join me in a, in a project of positivity because I think that would be a fruitless task. Um, but, you know, maybe there's work to be done with, with like-minded individuals from a number of different perspectives. So multi-professional working rather than psychologists talking at other people would be good. I think the second thing is that um, I think we need to be working, and I don't think this is, uh, this isn't um, revealing a secret, it's putting down a pledge, really. I think we need to be working on training. So for, as clinical psychologists, we work on what we call a formulation-based approach. So we sit down with people, work out what the best way to understand their problems are, the best way to uh, explain their origin, the best way to help, and we kind of work out this story. But that's multi-professional too. That's what good nurses should do, what good occupational therapists would, should do. It's what good, should, what good social workers should do, and it's what good psychiatrists should do. So one of the things we're planning 
actively planning is is thinking about uh, training in how to actually do this practically, how how it would work. work whoops, were you to do this with with people? And then the final thing of what next is um, well, there's a guy called Marius Rom, who is big in the hearing voices movement in Europe, and he took my PhD supervisor to task. He said, Richard, he goes. Uh, your problem is you want to explain voice hearers. I want to liberate them. So I think what we need to do is to, I said earlier, we need to stop being monolithic. I think we need to stop being professional. I think we need to see this as the rise of citizenry. I was speaking earlier that one of the things that has happened is, I think over the past 20 years, we've moved from mental health being something that is them to something that is us. And you see this in politicians, even in this city, I think the mayor was talking about family issues around his experience. So I think we need to see this as a community, citizen, uh, voted. One of, there's a, sorry I'm rambling a bit, but there's a statistic that we use in the UK which is probably misleading, it's probably actually wrong, which is that one in four of us will experience mental health issues in our lives. I think it's wrong because we all do, so I think the answer is 100%. But even if that were true, even if it's true that one in four people uh, experience serious mental health problems in their lives, it would be much better to say in the UK that's 20 million voters, and in the US, that's, that's about uh, 80 million voters. It'd be nice to talk about this in terms of voters, in terms of citizens, in terms of us all, rather than them who have a problem that need explaining. So a bit of citizen power, and you know, like I said earlier, um, some of us are gay, get over it. Some of us hear voices, big wow. And just on a practical note, uh, he always does the visionary bit and I do the practical <laughs> bit. Um, we are, I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's okay to have a book and a downloadable PDF, but really like to get, and you know, if, if, if people can help, that'd be great, uh, or give us ideas, to get it out there on the internet in a more accessible form. So uh, a website for a start, which we're thinking about with videos and stuff. So yeah, hopefully. Well, you know, if somebody was to ask me how to treat schizophrenia, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at my job. I, I, I know how to do the clinical psychology shit pretty good. And, 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 and I'm a professor of clinical psychology and nobody's going to take that title away from me. I, you hope. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I have absolutely no idea how to cure schizophrenia. What I do know is that pretty much any intelligent community-based worker can sit down with a fellow human being and through discussion with them work out five or six straightforward things that would improve their lives today. Yeah, you know, we sort out benefits, we sort out housing, we sort out transport, we think about their relationships with their family, we think about their, their financial situation, we think about their relationship with their employer, we sort out physical health problems. Once you, once you move away from what's the cure for schizophrenia to what can we do with this individual to just help them make their life better, things become a lot easier. So this formulation, if in technical language, a formulation-driven approach, what can we do as a community of, of professionals to help somebody lead a more fulfilled life? That's a lot easier to answer as a question than how do we cure schizophrenia. Well, yeah, but in a way, how do you click cure schizophrenia is a meaningless yeah, question because there, there isn't a thing called schizophrenia. There's just a range of experiences like we've been describing. And so there's not a thing to be cured. I, I, I thought I made that clear. Uh, did you? I, I, I have a response and a, and a question. Because I think you bring up a really good point. I mean, so here we have a, a Western medical model that has this idea of schizophrenia. And then it, it, it takes it and it puts it onto all kinds of people and different kinds of backgrounds. And then you have those people who then have to take that and interpret it and figure out what to do with it. And often, as we know, 
just having that label ends up causing so many problems. You know, it like there's so like there's such a disconnect. Um, so I, I just wonder if there's some role to play in kind of popular education. Mm -hmm. You like because I think one of the most po like the most powerful things that you all are doing is that because you're professionals and you're saying this, it has so much more weight than if the Icarus Project has a bunch of crazy people just saying it, you know? And it's better if we do it together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that, but like, it, it just occurs to me that I, I wonder what the role is for um, being able to go into communities. One of the beautiful things is, you know about New York City is there's people from all over the world here. There's communities mm -hmm. like just really literally from all over the world and, and how people interpret the Western medical model and how we can then change that to talk about empowerment and bring people together. I don't know, it seems like there's some... Well, I mean, I think one of the ways in which, one of the reasons why Jeffrey Lieberman said what he did was because it genuinely is dangerous. If, if, if people wearing suits and ties and holding professorial chairs say, you know, I think you're wrong, that's kind of dangerous because it starts to open up cracks. So I, I think, as Anne said, I think the partnership between saying, yeah, just helping people stopping being being dispossessed by the system, I guess. certainly something we, we thought about. One of the things coming out of the DSM debacle was the uh, idea that ADHD basically doesn't exist in France. So for one of the, uh, North America is different from Europe in many ways, but of course the UK isn't the same as, as France. So one of the things that we're continuously pointing out is that these things are cultural. They're, 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 so France... The, the rates of diagnosis of ADHD and the prescription of Ritalin in France isn't zero, but it's extraordinarily small. And what's happening in the UK is the, the diagnosis of ADHD and the prescription of Ritalin is going up. And in the, uh, in the America and uh, in, in the US, uh, diagnosis of ADHD and prescription of Ritalin is uh, pretty much a national emergency as far as I can see, but I'm not sure how many people realize that. Diagnosing kids with incurable brain diseases because they don't fit in with the American uh, high school system and poisoning their brains with Ritalin strikes me as something one should do only very cautiously with a great deal of high quality medical advice. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess that ties to what you were saying is that I've heard that, you know, uh, talk about the idea of prodromal syndrome yeah, yeah. Yeah. and you know and having yeah I think I think it's the idea of managing kids in their in situation rather than other issues or yeah, and the parents have and it, an answer. And, yeah. it, it frightens me that uh, that what happens with with a number of people, in, including people that I love, that they get identified as having problems. And instead of saying, "Let's help you out over this problem," it's wham, that's it. That's who you are. That's what that's what you get. And you know, um, antipsychotic medication. If you take antipsychotic medication for a few months and then come off it, bad. I I took antipsychotics for three days, just because I thought I'd try them. See what they're like. They're not. They're not kind of fun. Um, they're, not, they're, they're not drugs of abuse. Let's put it that way. Um, and the day afterwards, I was absolutely convinced there were people walking through my hotel room. And maybe, maybe I was making up. Maybe I was exaggerating. Maybe I was scared of what would happen. Or maybe when you when you take drugs that suppress your dopamine levels and then come off them and your dopamine levels bump up again, maybe it has weird consequences for your perceptual system. So what you get is people who've got a crisis. They get diagnosed. They get given medication. Medication is helpful. You take it at high doses for long periods of time. So I worry about 
instead of helping people resolve issues in their lives, we, we diagnose and medicate them in, in, for, for long term. So, so I think this idea of being responsive rather than um, blanket and formulaic in our approach to people is, is, is key. Also, just to add on to that real quickly, antipsychotics actually are used as, I mean, they're often, like soldiers take snort Seroquel. Okay. I mean, it's like the, it, it, you know, it, they end up being used. If you need to, if you need to reduce stress, yeah. 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 yeah they, they have that. Yeah, I wandered around, uh, around Paris kind of being kind of in the sort of state of, of, of I had a lot of make physio, but kind of blissful. It was, kind of, it was what it was. I went to the Louvre and I thought, yeah. <laughs> um, can you talk more about the possible um, like negative long-term side effects of, of antipsychotics and when stabilizers like Seroquel, for example? I, 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 question? Yeah. I, Repeat the question. Oh, so the question is about the long-term uh, adverse effects of, of antipsychotics. Yeah, the truth is um, I'm scared of them. I read, the, I read the literature and we know that they have uh, dangerous effects on on people's liver, on people's kidneys. That there's some suggestions that, that obviously they have long-term effects on the brain. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm I'm not trained in in medical issues. I read the literature and I realise that people with a, a a diagnosis of schizophrenia, people who've been taking medication long-term, have reduced life expectancies. They, people with those sorts of uh, diagnoses, probably taking medication, tend to die 15 to 20 years earlier than they otherwise would. Now, well, we don't we don't quite know why some people take their own lives, and that affects the statistics. Not everybody with a diagnosis on medication. I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert. Uh, in, a, in in order to understand the direct physical effects of these drugs on the brain, that's where I would look to my psychiatrist colleagues. And you know that's important because we do need medics in this in this game. This is not a game where we should push our medical colleagues to the outside. What We need them to help us. We need them to... I don't want to prescribe medication. I want a psychiatrist to work with me to do that. I want a psychiatrist to understand the physical effects of these drugs on the brain. And I have to confess, I, I can't answer your question because I don't know. I do know that all of the evidence is that, that they have long-term serious effects on, yeah, on the brain Yeah, a lot the of the work on this has been done in the States by, uh, you probably know, Robert Whittaker from Mad in America. Well, he, that was the, the book about it. He called Mad in America, but it's now a very, very good website. popular consensus that uh, psychedelic drugs uh, both trigger uh, late um, psychotic episodes and people are predisposed to it as well as are particularly dangerous for those who are, uh, have uh, schizophrenia or similar kind of problems. Um, there's also some people who uh, originally take originally take psychedelics in the kind of ayahuasca communities and think that ayahuasca is universally healing and safe or potentially at least very helpful for with, uh, psychosis. Uh, how do you feel about that? Yeah, so, so the person I turn to there is, uh, that's worth reading, I think is a, a Dutch, uh, I'm not sure whether there's a psychiatrist or psychologist, but a guy called Jim Van Os. Who psychiatrist. Talk, psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. He talks a lot about the relationship between um, street drugs and, and other risk factors. And the, his understanding is, not quite that uh, people have latent psychosis, which is then triggered by taking street drugs, but it's certainly not that some of these drugs are irrelevant when it comes to psychotic experiences. What, he's, what he talks about is um, quite an elegant combination of risk factors that potentiate each other, but also sensitive periods in people's lives. So I guess the quintessential uh, risk would be uh, a young man, maybe... 16, 17, because that's, there's a developmental issue here. Maybe somebody from a disadvantaged community, maybe black, maybe exposed to discrimination, racism, and, and other paranoia-inducing pressures in their lives, who maybe goes without sleep a little bit, maybe has some other life experiences, maybe has experienced domestic abuse, and then takes, uh, smokes a lot of crack, uh, um, takes, uh, smokes a lot of skunk. And the dopaminergic effects of some of these drugs combined with the paranoia-inducing social conditions, combined with the life experiences, combined with the lack of sleep, it all pushes. So it's not quite psychosis proneness plus drugs equals schizophrenia. It's more understand how the brain, including the biological functioning of the brain, responds in these complex social situations. And of course, added to that, some people, probably like me, have some biological traits that 
that move them a little bit more in that direction than others. It all, it all adds up and potentiates each other. Uh, Jim Van Oss, so his surname is O.S. Van Oss. Uh, he's written in Nature, there's a good paper in Nature about, um, I think it's called The Environment and Schizophrenia. Um, he's done a TEDx talk as well. Very yeah, good. the TEDx talk is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a website saying schizophrenia does not exist, but it's in Dutch. So. No, it's not. So oh, there's there's oh, an English version. Okay. Yeah. It's really I new. Quick, I have a quick response, and then there was a person on the back, and then a person there. So my response is that... Um, back in 2002, the Icarus Project started a website, and we put a bunch of forums on it. And one of the one of the forums that we put on it is called "Give Me Lithium or Give Me Meth." And it's about the relationship between um, mental health issues and illicit drug use. And if you go there, you can read all kinds of amazing accounts that people have. Um, there's hundreds of posts on there from all over the world where people are talking about their relationships with the different kinds of drugs they've taken. I myself personally um, have had a really complicated relationship with marijuana going back to when I was a young teenager that I can't really smoke it because it triggers me into like extreme states of mania, which periodically I, I'm, I'm into. <laughs> so I like, um, but so for a long time I, I would like I used to say that I um, balanced my brain chemistry with, uh, you know, lithium and marijuana. Matt <laughs> has had serious mental health problems all of his life, and he's 10 years older than me, so I saw it when I was very young, I saw, saw these things. I'd never touch. I've smoked dope, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do cocaine or, or ecstasy. I would be terrified of it, even now. Uh, you know, well past the developmental risk periods. When I was 16, 17, I, kn I knew that this was something I didn't want to want to do. Now, I might be over over egging the pudding. I might be uh, yeah, I might be worried more than I need to be. Maybe I could have had a fun time, but I was I was kind of cautious about it. Um, and that doesn't mean to say I believe that I have latent psychosis or attenuated psychosis syndrome that would be precipitated by the drugs. I just think it'd probably do me a lot of harm. I'm I'm nearly fucking psychotic as it is. So if it pushed it that far then you know <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, you. Okay. Thank you. Kind of answered my question in a roundabout way, but already. But going back to the beginning of the presentation, we were talking a lot about this idea of mental illness being defined in terms of someone's sort of genetic predisposition or bad defective genes. But I feel like there's also a lot of really interesting and potentially positive research and like information out there about understanding ourselves genetically. And so kind of thinking about moving forward in this work, I know, I know neither of you are geneticists nor genetic counselors, but do you care to speculate a little bit about ways that that kind of knowledge and that kind of expertise could be you know, marshaled in this, not like a war against a particular kind of biological model, but a way of like salvaging some of the good stuff that is in that biological research? I've, I've, this is a shameless plug, so I've, I've written a blog called Me, My Brain and Baked Beans, where I talk about some of the things that kind of drive us crazy. Um, uh, 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 this it's is, on, it will be on uh, the yeah, site yeah, that I just oh, showed. Yeah, yeah, kind of in there. Um, so I suppose to cut to the chase, one of the things is, um, I, I'm hesitating because I, I don't want to be arrogant, but I realise I'm speaking to Americans, so I just should say the truth. Shouldn't I? So, so I, I think I'm, 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 I think I'm a pretty good academic, and one of the reasons why I'm an academic is I'm quite creative. So I think about these things, and I think about about problems, and then I think uh, in alternative ways. Uh, I think that's good. I think that's that's valuable. I'm also uh, I'm periodically miserable, and Anne tells me off for being being negative, but I have I have high standards. I shall tell you now. I'm coming up for fifty, and I haven't got knighthood yet. No, pe people of people my, my quality in life should be knighted. You know, I, sh I should be Professor Sir Peter Kenderman. This, this is what should happen. And Careful, I'm, Peter. And, and I, I'm not being... I'm not, you know, I am getting carried away. The point, the point is... So, so my point is that some of these things have dangers. They have dangers in terms of your mood. So I am genuinely upset. You know, I haven't achieved all the things I want in life. On the other hand, it's driven me forward. And I'm kind of, I say stupid things. I say inappropriate things in public and people, I have to smile in an insouciant way in order to allow people to kind of move on from it. <laughs> but I think these traits, these traits of fantasy, these traits of emotional reactance, these traits of um, high standards, these traits of uh, lateral and creative thinking, 
I, I, I guess if I took ecstasy, they may be pretty bad for me, but I think they're pretty good in a, in a professor. You've got to just keep them in balance. So, so I guess, again, in a roundabout way, I don't think we inherit schizophrenia. I think we inherit the tendency to go A, B, C, Z. That's what we do. So um, my question was, uh, have you guys, have you worked with uh, any cognitive neuroscientists in the way the uh, brain processes information? Um, because uh, there's been certain, um, basically, pushes in the research that's showing, casing that basically the brain, how it actually just yeah. basically does uh, pattern recognition. So uh, basically implicating that schizophrenia or the voices are just an advanced version of pattern recognition that hasn't really been um, understood by the person experiencing it. Um, so I'm asking, yeah. has you have you got in there with like an fMRI or, what, or other different systems to actually watch these patterns, br you know, okay. light up? So, and, so and we, yeah, yeah. So the the the, the question is about the relationship between kind of cognitive neuroscience and brain functioning at the neural level and some of these experiences. Um, and I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm well aware of the fact that my, my brain is the organ with which we process information. That's obviously true. And so it would be bizarre if, if the things that we're talking about were not the product of a functioning brain. Again, one side issue is that's not the same as being ill. That's yeah. just our brains process information and let's understand it. And to answer your question specifically, no, uh, I haven't done any work in that area. The people you want to look at are uh, two guys, um, Richard Bentel, who was my PhD supervisor, and a guy called Dan Freeman, who's a professor at Oxford, and both of them are working with neuroscientists to do exactly that. And both from the perspective that, you know, hearing voices is a phenomenon. You know, hearing voices, you know, your brain is processing information when you hear voices. That's what's happening. So let's have a look at, at what's going on but not as an illness, just as a let's understand this phenomenon. And so yeah. Richard Mental and Dan Freeman are yeah. looking exactly at that. They've sorry. both written books that are for a public audience available on yeah. Amazon as well. Yeah. Oops, sorry, I shouldn't say that in a bookstore. No. <laughs> available, I'm sure, no. in all no, the bookstores. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I'm a, I'm a doctor, I work in the emergency department, and I take care of patients, people that come in when they're in, in a psychotic state, um, when they're having that moment of crisis. Um, their voices or whatever, and usually what we do is, if they're really agitated, we'll give them some antipsychotics or benzodiazepines, and then we consult psychiatry, and either psychiatry decides to admit them. I, in medical school, was in the inpatient psych ward. I know what that looks like. I feel mixed about how useful of a place that is to send people, but or or we send them home with like an outpatient follow-up appointment, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I don't really feel very satisfied with what we're offering people, and I just, we don't really have, I don't, we don't have like a lot of other good options. I like have tried to find some, I've like made, you know, lists of meditation centers or like different different things to try, or like try and offer, but I don't know if you guys have any comments about. Okay, well funnily enough, we were just visiting somewhere earlier today in New York City that is doing exactly that. The, uh, Peter mentioned earlier, the Parachute Project, they uh, uh, have crisis, um, what do they call mobile crisis teams, but also, um, we didn't know about this, we just heard about it today, uh, what they call respites, wh which is um, houses where you can go when you are in a state like you describe, where it's non-medical, where nobody's going to push uh, a medical understanding of your uh, difficulties on you, not going to um, force you to have medication. Um, uh, and they are staffed, I believe, by people with lived experience here, peers. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we have a similar, I worked in the, in the UK, um, very closely with a crisis house, where which was which was, which was exactly the same. I think it's you know people do often need somewhere to go when they're in um, in crisis, but psychiatric wards aren't necessarily the most helpful places. Yeah. Um, so we need alter alternatives. We've been in correspondence with a guy who was extremely angry at the idea of people being given medication, which he described forcibly, which he described as the equivalent of rape, and he described it extremely graphically as the equivalent of rape. Brain rape, uh, you brain said, rape. Yeah. Um, I myself, I'd take antipsychotics. I have taken antipsychotics. Um, I'd take antipsychotics. I, I don't want to be in distress. Um, so I think the idea of, of responding as a physician dealing with the, the crisis that you find in front of you. And then, as you say, finding the right place to refer somebody to get help is absolutely right. Our point is, of course, but those alternative responses are being developed. And I, I guess the challenge back to you is um, 
find them and make use of them because they do exist. If they turn out to be dangerous, you know, we'll, we'll withdraw and try something different. But uh, the parachute project in New York City is, is developing that. And my, our understanding from today is they've got, a, they're now working towards a two hour response. So they'll get a team to the emergency room in two hours. We'll actually send someone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they were saying that when the first the project first started, people were worried that people would die and it was not safe, and nobody's died yet, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name is Mark Brown. I've been diagnosed with schizoaffective for a number of years now. It's definitely not a black and white uh, topic to this whole thing. Uh, the DSM. I, I personally like. I buy the DSM. I like reading. It. Mm -hmm. I don't like when psychiatrists read. Ah, uh, like uh, yeah. You know? Good point. Good point. There's an art to it. They don't really, sometimes they overdo it. They kind of like, they focus on it too much. But there's, yeah. you know, there's an art to it sometimes. Good psychiatrists know how to use it. You know? Yeah, so the point was about, it's different, DSM is something that you can use in different ways, right? And it really depends how it's used. And, and also, like you say, who reads it? Yeah. And who uses the language? So we, we know that from other liberation movements, from, from, uh, from uh, civil rights issues in terms of uh, gay people, in terms of black people. It depends who uses the language. So if I want to describe myself as being schizophrenic, I think that's very different from a doctor telling me that I'm a schizophrenic. So yeah, owning the, owning the language, I, yeah, I think that's a very valuable point. You should own the language. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say more about um, the correlation between So, so the question is about the correlation between uh, um, traumatic experiences and uh, experiences of deprivation, poverty and so forth, and psychosis, uh, but also about the way in which uh, that happens, that's observed, and then people respond still with the biological approach. I, I, I've joked about it, and again, it's a joke with truth, about a deep sigh. So the guy sits down and goes, well, so, you know, your, your son's serving abroad in Afghanistan and uh, your daughter no longer wants to speak to you and your husband has left you for a younger model and uh, you've, you've been told that you're going to lose your job and uh, the, the housing in which you live is a, is a little bit shitty and uh, uh, you, you, you've got an experience of uh, childhood abuse that you're dealing with and uh, yeah, I can kind of understand why you'd feel hopeless and pointless and lethargic and that there's no real point in living. Anyway, would you like some SSRIs? That happens a lot. I think the, I mean, the data are out there, so they're not, they're not a hundred percent. It's not the case that schizophrenia is post-abuse syndrome. It's more complicated than that. It's also not the case that schizophrenia is is induced by drugs. It's not the case that schizophrenia is unrelated to those issues. These these factors, out in the same way that falling in love with people is not a single issue biologically determined phenomenon. It's, there are many, many reasons why I ended up married to the woman that I'm married to. They're, that's a complex story and there's loads of factors. And why people would end up with a particular experience is due to a complex mix of factors. Why somebody ends up in debt is due to a complex mix of factors. What we know is that, that about 25, 26% of, especially women, experience uh, traumatic sexual experiences in their childhood. And maybe the same uh, proportion of people get bullied at school. And around 70, 80% of people who hear voices report those sorts of experiences. So the, the correlation is strong. Um, and I think that the, the, the second issue is that we know that there are quite uh, convincing psychological explanations for why that might be. So what people commonly report is a couple of phenomena. There's many, many issues to this, but a couple of phenomena. One is a lot of kids who are exposed to traumatic experiences in their childhood report dissociating. They, they report withdrawing from the reality, pulling away from the reality of what's happening to them and sometimes creating a fantasy world, sometimes just, just not experiencing what is experiencing in front of you. So they've learned, they've taught themselves 
to, to regard reality as something for which they, they almost play active games, they pull away from it. And the second thing is, uh, uh, a large number of people who hear distressing voices either report that the voices are the voice of their abuser, or they report that the voice is coming from a dominant and abusive, controlling, superior position, basically echoing the abuse experiences. So that combination, what do you do when you're abused? You withdraw from reality, you pull away from, from reality, you play fantasy games with reality, you withdraw emotionally from what's happening to you, and you have traumatic recollections of the, the things that were said to you as a child. Yeah, that's a, that's a convincing causal explanation as well. So the stats are there, and the psychological causal explanations are there. Yeah, that's what's, but not for everybody. Not for everybody. So. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much. And for, like you said, putting your uh, professional uh, weight and credentials behind the work that so many people have done and have and suffered through. Um, and my question is maybe for you or right, for the room, I'm not sure, but does anybody know if there are lists of therapists that or it's like that, that we can find who share this so that it's not just like kind of terrifying interview process. So, and also, um, I feel like at places like New York City, there are resources to access, but for people that we love who don't live in New York City, who live in rural places, um, or who are not able or willing to leave their homes, I guess, you know, listen in other parts of the country, but then also, um, does anybody have? Um, thoughts about or resource lists of people who do uh, who use the internet like skyping psychotherapy and um, etc. I mean there are forums where therapists put their I'm not aware of such a thing. I think it's a great idea, actually. There is an organisation that we just talked at their conference called the International Society for Social and Psychological Treatments of Psychosis. And I guess any therapist who's a member of that would share some of this. You know, there, are, there would still be a spectrum of, of opinion, probably, uh, especially in the States, uh, quite a few people are rather more conservative in their views. But nevertheless... That would be some in indication, but no, I, I, I don't. I'm not aware of such a thing, and I think it would be a great idea. I, th I think I think it'd be an excellent idea. Um, I don't disagree with it at all. Uh, the only caveat I would have is that I, I completely 100% agree with the aspiration. I'd also quite like the emergency rooms across New York City to know how to respond to people in crisis, rather than to opt out of the system. I'd quite like to change the system rather than just encourage people to opt out yeah, of it. Yeah, that's true. That we, we know. Our report is not just saying, you know, um, we're not just trying to get business for therapists and psychologists saying, you know, come and talk to us. It's, it's much more about hopefully changing every single conversation that happens within mental health services. Including, I mean, as we heard, making it the case that, that insurance companies are willing to reimburse people who organise open dialogue projects. That's, that's part of the system change. Because if they're not part of the system, they're not available to people. And especially... Yeah, a lot of people with the more serious mental health problems are also very poor, so these things have to be provided. You can go and find a therapist if you pay for them, but to provide them for the citizens of New York City means a slightly different approach to it. Um, so another way to answer the question, <coughs> the idea of having a provider network of allied providers is something that for the last decade the Affairs Project has worked on in various capacities, but it's never really come together. Um, there's a bunch of people in this room who are part of the New York City Icarus group who were here a couple months ago and we had a, a night where we were sharing resources and we came up with this map of, of resources of the city. And I think um, there's a bunch of people in this room who are interested in continuing that kind of work, like New York City-centric work. Um, I think, you know, there's resources like like the Madden America website, you know, I don't know if they actually have a provider network on the Madden America website, but um, I think that that's like probably a good place to start. Um, I, there were a bunch of people who raised their hands. If, if there are people who have specific responses to what we're talking about, then I'll call on you. Okay, so. Yeah, there is something called the International Society for Ethical Psychiatry and Psychology, and it's like psychiatrists and psychologists mainly basically adopt this perspective, and a lot of them are treatment providers as well. Mm -hmm. I think what you can do is you can sort of track them down and find one that's like you're interested in a certain part of the country, track them down and say, hey, is there anyone you would recommend? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's, uh, I mean, it's not a huge thing. It's not like an HTML plan that costs the country. But, uh, you know, I think that's a hundred million. And their, their website, I think, is ISEPP.org. What is it? What's, what's it stand for again? The International Society for Ethical Psychiatry and Psychology. Thank you. Anybody else on the, on the theme? Just a, just a clarification. Um, I was speaking to someone about the parachute project. Um, and they were saying that to use the parachute project, and there's also one in New Jersey also, which I just heard about. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them require the people to have a, have, a, have a house or, or, or have an apartment so they don't, not, not people who are homeless, but people who have a, have a, have a, a house and want a uh, respite. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There's also the Rock Dove Collective. Um, I know that they. I the know Rock Dove Collective? Yeah, they have um, a whole section that's all for like therapy and psychotherapists. Um, and that's based in New York. Yeah. Um, well, this month is Autism Awareness Month, and there's a really great organization called the Autism Self Advocacy Network that might have some resources for people who um, are also on the autism spectrum, because that can sometimes overlap yep. with um, just different forms of mental illness and experience. Um, yeah, so they might have connections to resources that are less ableist and centered around people who are neurologically able. I think the, the, the use of the word ableist is also very interesting because one of the things we haven't drawn out perhaps is, is also the power of uh, discussing these sorts of issues in terms of disability. So certainly in the UK, if you have a disability, your employer has a legal obligation to adapt to your disability. So regarding not only autistic spectrum problems, but also mental health issues as disabilities brings a certain different perspective. If you regard them as illnesses, it doesn't have quite the same issue. So one of the, one of the movements is, is about moving from, like, so we, we kind of move, Anne and I are kind of moving from the language of illness to the language of normality. But another approach is to move from the language of illness to the language of disability. So, for instance, quite a few employers deal with uh, people who have episodes of mania and hypermania as if it's a disability. So their, their employment contract says that they can just take two weeks off at the drop of a hat, which is because why? Because it's a reasonable adjustment to their disability. And that's very different from saying, if you're ill, we're not going to employ you. If you're well, we'll employ you. It's saying, I have a disability that involves this adjustment to my working practices. So the disability language is another way. So when you mentioned ableist, the disability dialogue is another way of thinking creatively and alternatively about, about serious mental health problems. Okay, a few more. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So I would like to know more about the relationship between um, like psychotic symptoms and religious beliefs. You know, um, after the movie gets out, as Christian Bell came out and said, he thought that Moses was schizophrenic, you know, and everybody was like going crazy about it. So I wanted to know like these psychotic symptoms, like what relationship do they have with religious beliefs? Well, certainly, um, and what, well, we've got a bit about this in the report. There is a, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the question was, what's the relationship between psychotic experiences and religious beliefs? Um, some, you know, obviously in, within some religious contexts, experiences that might be seen as psychotic in other contexts are actually valued. So in Pentecostal churches, hearing voices um, is, is valued. It was, it was really interesting, actually, when we had the launch of the doc document in, uh, in London. It was in a Quaker meeting house where we held it. And um, we had one speaker, I didn't know this, but he was a Quaker, and he said, I think it's really appropriate that I have spent many Sundays sitting in this very room with, about, with a thousand other people, because it's a really big one, waiting to hear voices. <laughs> so uh, it is something about, uh, about the, uh, the context, really. There's, there's this also the other issue, which maybe we haven't brought out as much as we could have done tonight, which is it's all about whether it adversely affects your life. Yeah. If, if it makes your life better, fine, who cares? If on the other hand, these experiences are neither illness nor disability, in your, but if it's <coughs> adversely affecting your life, then, then a bit of professional help might be, might be useful. So it's not about whether it's ill or well or accepted in a religious framework or not. What, what matters is whether it's, whether it's helping, whether it's helpful, whether it's distressing, whether it's disabling.
It, it, but this, but I, I go back to the, the other question. So, so the question is how we get funded for this work. And the answer is, you know, in, in the United Kingdom, people pay their taxes and really we have a national don't. health service. Where <laughs> it's free at the point of use. I'm, I'm paid to do this because it's my job. That's what I do. It doesn't help. No, not, it, 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 I, I don't. I don't. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> take, take whichever politician is to the left wing of Obama and vote for them in the next election. Vote for Hillary, for God's sake. Get it. Get a oh, no, no. get a systematized healthcare system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, somebody, I, so, somebody more left wing than Hillary then. But I, I don't know. I can't. It's difficult to answer that question. It is true, however, that you know. The, the, the parachute project is funded by a large grant from the city, so it, it, isn't, it isn't all doom and gloom here. It's just kind of different, I guess. Part of me hopes that as we move the dialogue from them to us... The Poetry workshops and just, you know, writing workshops in general, that's something that would be interesting. Yeah, the question is, um, is there a, ro <clears throat> a role for creative creativity and... Um, things that en enhance creativity in, in working with psychosis. Yes, definitely. Um, I think, um, you know, there's a, there is a, um, as Peter was saying, I guess there's a correlation between psychosis and creativity, but also, um, I guess, we're, we're trying to get away from the idea that um, there are specific treatments that only professionals can deliver and they do to people, to um, thinking about th us all exploring um, what can help and that for a lot of us creative activity is very very helpful to our mental health um, And in fact, there's, there's some, some evidence of, of that uh, academic evidence now So yeah, it's, it's more about a shift in emphasis from a specific kind of lock and there used to be a kind of lock and key idea that um, you know, there's a, a, a Lock which is the, the, the illness that you have to kind of find the shape of and then the doctor makes the key and the key fits the lock and, and actually I don't think in mental health finding forms of help um, is like that. That's in, in fact why we called our section what can help rather than treatment um, because it's, it's about finding for each person uh, what helps them and that for a lot of us that can include creative activities. Yeah. And art and music and singing and even dance. So there's even a, and it, I wouldn't go this far myself but there's a phenomenon called body psychotherapy where yoga is seen as very helpful. And, and there are good psychological reasons why. So singing is very interesting because it's actually quite difficult to have hallucinations and sing because just because of the way in which the brain forms words. So it's just quite difficult. Many people find that, that singing it offers them a bit of temporary relief from hallucinations, for instance. Um, but there's also something about the way in which you control your body in yoga that, that might help people gain uh, more, maybe more control over what's happening to them but also more sense of control over what's happening and I'm not suggesting that there's a prescription that I would make to people but writing definitely creative writing like like uh, poetry definitely um, visual art but then music and uh, and, and even uh, dance and, and physical arts they're, they're all very valuable for people in different combinations Okay, the question is, do drug companies have an influence over the medical model and do they particularly have an influence in the US? Uh, yes and yes, is the answer, I think. Um, <laughs> I mean, I put up, obviously, you know, that it's not their fault in a way. What are they for, drug companies? To sell their products, that's what they're for. So they would do whatever it takes to sell their products. And obviously the story, the, the kind of general story that's out there at the moment that, you know, if you hear voices, for example, that means you have schizophrenia, which is a chemical imbalance which can be rectified by Zyprexa or whatever, whichever the product is. It's a very useful one for, for the pharmaceutical companies because, you know, what, what's, the, what's the result of it? People buy their products and this, the idea is that, you know, we actually need their products. We've got an imbalance that the, the products rectify. So, 
Uh, there's a lot of evidence that I mean, they push the medical model very hard. You know, a lot of the, the we put, I think one of the quotes up there is from Zyprexa.com. You know, the um, so that a lot of public information at the moment is funded by directly or indirectly by drug companies, and yes, particularly in the states, we have it in the in the UK as well, but it's not as bad. I, I think the particular issue is the lifelong intractable without yes message. So, I repeat, I mean, I you know. Uh, my, my brother, when he was going through a particularly difficult time, shot me on one occasion. You know, kind of psychosis can be kind of a bit unpleasant at times. If I started to become uh, manic, uh, yeah, I'd kind of quite like some medication. Um, not, I w- You're becoming d- manic now. Yeah, I'll shut up. Um, <laughs> but, and I'd, I'd really like the pharmaceutical companies to work with high-quality psychiatrists to, to generate new generations of medication that, that's more effective. But I like them to be quite effective in the short term to help me through crises. I'm not sure that I want them to find a way of hooking me on drugs lifelong so that they get a, a, a guaranteed income stream. So I think there's a huge role for uh, biological scientists, psychiatrists, doctors, and of course the pharmaceutical companies that make these drugs. I think the question is, you, know, ha- you now have the symptoms of a lifelong illness that can only be treated with lifelong prescription. And you know, it's only in very few medical conditions that we prescribe people antibiotics long-term prophylactically. Um, most people, the idea is that you take them for a prescribed dose and when that's, you, you finish it, it's really bad to have antipsychotics, kind of out, uh, antibiotics okay. out there in the system for various reasons. So high-quality drugs work with the pharmaceutical companies, but don't say, this is it, we've got you on our books now. Do you think that's a deliberate fabrication? No. Uh, there's in, I'm a psychologist. I believe in the law of effect from, I don't know, 1804 or wherever it was, which is if you reward somebody for something, they're going to repeat it. So it's, it's almost like natural selection. If, if, if there's a system that gives them an income stream, then they're going to do it again. I don't think they're, I don't think they're Nazis out to... to to destroy us, I think that the system has conspired that we're all trapped in this in this cycle, but we need to move away from it. No, I don't think they're doing it deliberately. I think they probably think they have our best interests at heart, but the system's a bit skew if and we need to correct it. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you. This is really, like, everyone who's in this room, you know, like, in many ways, this is a historical night. Like, you're going to remember this night because, you know, like, in the, in the future, the medical model is in a process of shifting. And, like, we are an active part. Everyone who's here tonight who's participating is an active part in, like, pushing the, pushing the old model over. So, once again, like, yeah. a big round of applause for her. For those who don't know, the Icarus Project has an event here, like the first Wednesday of every month. So that's, I don't know if it's next week or the week after, but uh, it's, the after. it's the week after next. And actually what the event is, is we're going to be talking about what happened here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's a week from Wednesday. It's a week from... April Fool's. April Fool's Day, that's right. Perfect. How perfect. <laughs> yeah, and there, there, there will be a video of, of stuff online. So tell other people who, like, if you came tonight and you thought this was really interesting, like, tell your friends about it and spread the word about it and spread the word and, like, check out their website and let's do what we can to just spread this message. And there, are, there are a few more copies of uh, the two reports at the front here. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you.